Hello, everyone. We're very thrilled to welcome Susan Middleton to Google today. Um, she was uh, the chair of the Department of Photography at the California Academy of Computer of Sciences from 1982 to 1995. Um, she currently serves as a research associate there and has been on many um, very interesting um, field uh, field trips and field work, which she will talk to us about today. And of course, she did get that always exciting and always enviable Guggenheim Fellowship as a result of her of her work. Um, her topic today is spineless the portraits of marine invertebrates, the backbone of life. It's the result of seven years of field work in the Pacific Ocean, and it's no wonder that the um, physical space at Google that we're broadcasting from today is also called the Pacific Ocean. Um, she's been instrumental in the protection of marine conservation areas off the Hawaiian Islands, um, resulting in the designation of the, uh, uh, the National Marine Monument that President Obama um, put in a few years ago. Um, he, uh, her work has earned praise and endorsements um, ranging all the way up to her deepness herself, Sylvia Earle. And so please join me as, she di as um, Susan discusses her photography and her approach to um, capturing these um, unique uh, animals. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to be here at Google um, in the Pacific Ocean part of Google. How appropriate is that? Because uh, I'm going to be showing you today, I'm going to be taking you on a little journey uh, into the marine invertebrate realm. Um, and I worked in three different places, uh, all in the Pacific Ocean. So all of the creatures I'm going to show you today are residents of the Pacific Ocean. Um, just by way of a little background, uh, I have been making portraits of native flora and fauna, plants and animals, for over 30 years. And I started uh, focusing on federally listed endangered species. All of the creatures I've photographed are under the US flag, and that's intentional because I want to bring awareness to the native flora and fauna that really share our own habitat uh, as US citizens. And I think oftentimes we're unaware of them. So I started with uh, what's sometimes uh, characterized as charismatic mega fauna. So a lot of mammals, birds, uh, endangered species that a lot of research had been done on, so they were well known. Uh, and then over the years, after six books, each time uh, a new project commenced, I was going a little bit more for the less conspicuous, less well-known, understudied realm of life, which I've learned is equally important to sort of how ecosystems function. And I attach myself to scientists to do my projects. And my work really bridges art and science. I've long been interested in the nexus between art and science. And I feel that artists and science, scientists are um, share a kind of motivation, which is a quest for discovery. And there's a lot of creativity uh, in the minds of scientists that I've worked with and many artists that I work with as well. And most of all, I know myself, am very inspired uh, by science. And I see a lot of the same uh, motivations uh, working. So this um, last project uh, resulted in a book that was just published called Spineless, Portraits of Marine Invertebrates, The Backbone of Life. And this is the cover of the book. And oh, the image you saw just before is the cover image. And this is a juvenile Pacific giant octopus, the most beautiful animal. And I've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, I think it's the most beautiful animal I've ever photographed. And that's saying something because <laughs> I've photographed a lot of animals. But this uh, is a juvenile, as I mentioned. and it would grow into a adult Pacific giant octopus, which is the largest octopus species in the world. But it almost had like a big attitude, even as a juvenile. Uh, and I worked with it over three days. And I'll show you, as I get a little bit further on in my presentation, um, how that happened, how I actually make these photographs. This is a nudibranch, uh, beautiful nudibranch with very long tendrils and tentacles. Opalescent nudibranch is the name of it. Um, and this looks very plant-like, and in fact, part of it is. The eelgrass that you see and the red algae attached to it is pl plant. But the star-shaped creature is actually 
a stock jellyfish. It's a jellyfish, and those little pom-pom uh, shapes are feeding tentacles. And this is a favorite organism uh, where I did a lot of field work on San Juan Island um, in the northwest coast waters. They're kind of hard to find. They're exquisitely beautiful. And unlike this photograph, they're constantly moving. And to get it with its uh, all of its star-shaped projectiles extended like this took a, took a lot of uh, patience. Um, I also worked on NOAA research vessels uh, off the coast of French Frigate Shoals, which is uh, one of the islands in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. There was a NOAA vessel that went out to that area, specifically looking at marine invertebrates, and also in the central Pacific around Palmyra, Kingman, and Jarvis. And this was a uh, looks almost like an extraterrestrial animal, I think. It's called a white phantom crab. And it was um, pulled up in a retrofitted lobster trap from uh, several hundred feet deep. Uh, and the whole uh, ship was staffed with marine invertebrate experts from around the world. So we had the experts on the ship. This realm of life is not uh, tends not to be funded as well in terms of the research and also the expeditions that are specifically focusing on marine invertebrates are few and far between. So it was very exciting to be able to be on this vessel photographing things that were being collected, some of which had never been seen before and some of which have since been described as new species to science. And I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more as I go on. This is called a four-line flatworm. I happen to love flatworms. Uh, it's one of my favorite kinds of animals. And this is one of them. And what I've learned is that flatworms are very important evolutionarily because they were the first kind of animal uh, that had bilateral symmetry and a central nervous system. So we sort of stand on the shoulders of these humble creatures, even though they don't have shoulders. <clears throat> uh, this is a giant fleshy scale worm. I became very enamored with the marine worms, and it took me a while because I sort of have an aversion to terrestrial worms. I don't know why. But in the marine realm, um, and I'll show you as we go along, the diversity of shapes and colors, and they're just phantasmagorical, better than uh, anything that Pixar could come up with, I think. And perhaps Pixar's uh, deriving some inspiration from this realm as well. This is a Taylor's sea hare. And normally, it grazes on blades of eelgrass, and it camouflages as beautifully as you can imagine. And I'm sure you're noticing by now that these, these images are not typical nature photography. I'm visually isolating my subject against a white or a black background. And I do that um, by modifying aquariums. They're all live animals. They're in the water. Uh, I make them as happy as I can. And I'll show you some images uh, as we go on that kind of give you a sense of, of how the images are achieved. Um, this is a lion's mane jellyfish. They get huge. This was, again, a juvenile. And this is a brittle star. They, it's interesting because it's kind of a misnomer. Brittle stars are not really brittle. They're, they're quite soft. They're quite fluid in the way that they move. And that central disc is not only soft, but must be succulent and delicious for fish because these animals always hide. They're never out in the open. If you're a snorkeler or a diver and you pick up a piece of coral rubble, oftentimes you'll see these brittle stars scurrying away to avoid uh, getting eaten. This is a shrimp from about 300 feet down on one of those NOAA research expeditions. Um, the sort of bluish uh, tinge that you see are actually eggs. So this is a pregnant female. And this is one of my favorites. It's reproduced really beautifully in the book. And I can have really beautiful prints made, but it's hard projecting. And, I'll t and the reason is because it's a frosted nudibranch, and it's so delicate. Um, it's, almost, it's translucent. It has a very, very pale, lovely pink, um, and a very delicate, lovely, beautiful animal. Uh, this is one of the new species to science uh, that I was fortunate enough to be able to photograph. And not only was I fortunate enough to be able to photograph it, but this is the only representative of this species that has ever been collected. Uh, this was on a NOAA research trip to French Frigate Shoals. It was 
came, it was hauled up um, in a baited lobster trap from about 800 feet down and collected. In other words, it was euthanized and collected because the scientists on board the vessel were fairly sure it was probably a new species. And the only way they can do the detective work to determine that is to actually have the specimen so they can do the morphological research, but also so they can do DNA sequencing. And it turned out it is a new species to science and has been named and described based on this actual animal. I call it the stilt walker. This is a three-line nudibranch. And this is a black-eyed squid, beautiful, uh, small animal that I photographed at uh, Friday Harbor Marine Lab off San Juan Island. And this is um, sometimes called a devil angel. Usually it's called a sea angel. It's a tiny little uh, creature. And you can see the sort of wing shapes uh, that it uses for locomotion. But also, occasionally, it protrudes these little uh, things that almost look like horns. So one of my mentors and muses, Gustav Pauli, uh, calls this a devil angel. This is a fragile file clam. Those are feeding tentacles and also used for locomotion, really spectacular animal. And this gives you an idea of uh, the NOAA vessels that I was on. This is the Hi'ielakai. And it's dispatched from Honolulu uh, regularly, usually uh, annually or biannually, to do coral reef ecosystem surveys up and down the northwestern Hawaiian island chain and also throughout the central Pacific. And I went on two of these research expeditions, as I mentioned earlier. So this is the main ship. And then there are zodiacs that get dispatched from that main ship. And you can see the dive tanks here. And that allows us to get to places that we couldn't get otherwise. Very fast. They're mobile. They're actually called fast boats. They're very, very spiffy. Um, boats. And then they get, um, there's a crane on the main vessel, and they get lowered and raised as, as needed. This is inside the wet lab on the NOAA vessel. It's kind of a small space. And I was sharing it with 10 other uh, researchers. So we had blue tape, and we'd each have like maybe a foot and a half or two feet maximum of counter space. Um, and this is Scott Godwin, who's one of the world's leading experts on hermit crabs, as well as other marine invertebrates. And he was collecting some wonderful specimens, keeping them happy in the lab so that they could uh, be looked at by the scientists and, in my case, photographed. And here we have fresh water being pumped in from outside the vessel and some animals waiting for their portraits. And these five-gallon buckets were kind of like little holding areas where animals would wait for their portraits to be made. And this is actually my little area in the wet lab. And you can see a little bit closer. There I am uh, with red hair, but it is me, <laughs> a couple of years ago, photographing a tiger cowrie, a live tiger cowrie. So you can see this is an aquarium. And I've modified it for the photography. So it has a white bottom. And then I actually have a piece of white plexiglass behind the aquarium that you can't see in this picture that creates the white background. And I'm lighting it from behind so that I can eliminate the shadows or at least control the shadows. And then I'm hand holding the key light. So I basically have the camera in one hand and a light in the other. Uh, and that's how, and a lot of patience. And this is the uh, final photograph of the tiger cowrie. You know, most people have seen these beautiful shells because they are spectacular. But most people haven't seen the animal that lives inside the shell. And the animals that live inside the shells are, of course, even more spectacular. And they make those homes. Uh, so this is the, the, the gray, uh, fleshy part of the animal is the animal that's completely, almost completely come out of the shell. And it can, it's called a mantle. It can completely cover its own shell. This is a hanging stomach jelly from around San Juan Island. And this is a smooth brown peanut worm. Uh, again, you know, it, was, it took me a while to warm up to the worms. But I decided after looking at this for a while and spending some time with Mary Rice, who is 90 years old and has spent her life becoming an expert on these animals. They're called cypunculans. Uh, she kind of turned me on to them. I said, well, how long do they live? She said, oh, I have pets that have been in my lab for 30 years. I thought, 30 years? Oh, my god. So I gave them a second look and decided they looked like Henry Moore sculptures. And they were beautiful in their simplicity. And uh, this is the picture that I was able to make. This is a suborcular Kelly clam. Spends This particular one spent its entire life inside a beer bottle and was protected in there. Got too big to get out, but that's actually fine with these clams because they get the protection of being inside the bottle, and they can extend their siphon out the neck of the bottle to feed. 
This is another one of those beautiful brittle stars. I photographed a lot of these because they, I loved their graphic shapes and every single one was different. Um, and so there's lots of them. These are sea slugs, also startling variety of shapes, forms, colors, textures. And that's what really drew me to the marine invertebrate realm as an artist was the, the inherent sort of design and elegance expressed in this realm of life. It's far more diverse than terrestrial um, fauna, though terrestrial fauna is wonderful and I spent many, many years focusing on that. I was just kind of blown away uh, by the animals uh, in the invertebrate realm. And it's interesting to note that 98% of the described animals in the sea, in the ocean, are in fact invertebrates. And <clears throat> as I've been taught by scientists, that number probably is closer to 99.9% .9 because so many animals in this realm have yet to be described, discovered and described. So we're vastly outnumbered. The, ma the marine mammals are vastly outnumbered and even on uh, the, in the terrestrial realm, uh, we're vastly outnumbered by the marine invertebrates. And not only that, it's this invertebrate realm that really creates the foundation for the marine ecosystem and for the terrestrial ecosystem. Um, it really is responsible. These animals collectively, along with the plants, are responsible for the air we breathe and the soil to grow our food and the water we drink, all of it. So they're important um, and they're also exquisitely beautiful. This is uh, two nudibranchs that are kind of, you know, on top of each other a little bit, called the pustulose nudibranchs, and I think they look like licorice candy. Uh, and this is a wonderful animal called a melibi, and it grazes on uh, seagrass. Um, it's just, you know, they're just beyond. This is a decorator crab, and you'll see several of these as I go along. These crabs, they go around and they just collect stuff. A lot of times it's algae, sometimes it's other marine animals like hydroids, and they kind of paste it. They have a little like glue kind of stuff they can secrete, and they attach it to themselves. It's kind of like, and everyone has a different style. Some of them like algae, some of them like red algae, some of them like brown algae. Um, but the idea is that they kind of blend in, and it's camouflage. Here's another one that's got some hydroids attached to its head like a, like a kind of a wild chapeau. Um, and it's constantly kind of, they check it to make sure that everything is in place. It's almost like somebody who's fastidious about their clothing. Um, this is a wonderful anemone from the Central Pacific around Palmyra, Kingman, and Jarvis. And one of the things that I can achieve by doing photography in this way is that you get to see more. So even the scientists who are very familiar with some of these organisms would come up and watch me photograph because in this case, I was told, well, you know, when you're underwater, you never see the stalk because it's buried in the sand. And you may see only just a portion of this kind of radial uh, portion of the animal. So you can see a lot more this way by visually isolating. This is called a strawberry drupa. Again, a gorgeous shell, but beautiful green animal that lives inside. So you see it kind of gradually uh, revealing itself here. Um, one of the ways that I achieved the photographs was to piggyback on research done at Friday Harbor Marine Lab. Uh, off San Juan Island, and this is one of the students. She had found, this is her favorite animal, it's called a nereus, or a banner sea nymph. And she had found one, and she had found one complete and whole, because they're very difficult to collect without breaking them. They're fragile. And so I was able to photograph it, it had beautiful iridescence, and actually has this proboscis that it can push out uh, when it either wants to be scary, or perhaps, uh, assist in uh, eating, but that's a retractable part there. Those, uh, and I was told about it, so of course I had to wait and wait and wait and wait till I saw it. So you see those black uh, mandibles in that picture. This is another little nudibranch. Um, nudibranchs have these interesting projectiles which are called rhinophores, and they're like sniffers. They perceive, they're chemosensory uh, perceivers. And uh, so that's what you're seeing uh, on, the, on the front end of, of this little nudibranch. This is called a treetop nudibranch. And this is an anemone that you see in four stages of opening. That took about three hours of waiting. That's called a Christmas anemone from around San Juan Island. And who knows, you know, what was going on. I sort of assumed that, well, maybe it just took a while for it to feel comfortable in the tank. Maybe it was hungry. Who knows? A lot you don't get to know. This is an amazing uh, marine worm called a... Uh, 
ground digger dumbbell worm. I think it looks kind of like one of the Blues Brothers. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it, there again, you know, an interesting sort of wild shape and character going on. This is another flatworm, orange rimmed flatworm. And this is another flatworm, the Pacific spotted flatworm. They're very beautiful, very delicate. And uh, as I mentioned before, they are the living, the closest thing that's living to the animal that jumped from sponges, which is a loose uh, assemblage of individual cells, into uh, a huge advancement evolutionarily of bilateral symmetry in a cent central nervous system and one end that leads. A lot of inventions uh, along with the emergence of this animal. This is a hanging stomach jelly that's blue. Uh, one of the things I'm also trying to do is actually make a portrait. I do consider myself a portrait photographer really more than a nature photographer because I'm trying to capture the character of an individual organism. So not just capturing a species. It's not really scientific documentation per se, though sometimes it's, it's used for that. Um, so it takes a lot of watching and paying attention to an individual organism. And sometimes I go back and photograph another individual of the same species because it's just different enough you know, to warrant it. So this is another jellyfish. And this is a very um, interesting animal called a comb jelly. And recently uh, I read, I believe in National Geographic, where um, this animal is of particular interest now to scientists because the nerve cells that exist in comb jellies are thought to be the earliest nerve cells evolutionarily and, um, and, the, and certainly the only ones that are extant now that represent that, those first nerve cells. So they're being uh, watched very carefully. And they also are very beautiful because they iridescent. It's, it, the cilia, little uh, tiny fibers, move constantly and uh, create these beautiful uh, shimmering color patterns. And these are called sea gooseberries, a similar thing with these beautiful shimmering color patterns that are constantly moving. And this is called a spaghetti uh, curly-headed spaghetti worm. A lot of these animals have terrific names. And normally, this animal will be completely covered with sand. It makes a sand tube, it lives under the sand, and then it extends its tentacles out to feed. So I spent hours sort of cleaning it up, getting rid of all the sand so you could really see the animal and uh, how, it, how it's built, how it's made. Um, this is called a broad-based tunicate. Uh, it's a sea squirt, and evolutionarily, it's uh, relatively, relatively, I say, close to human beings. Uh, it looks more like a vegetable. But scientists broadly divide um, animal life, multi-celled animal life, the metazoans, which includes us, into 34 categories. And those are called phyla, P-H-Y-L-A. So of the 34 phyla, 33 are invertebrates. And the 34th, chordata, includes us as the vertebrates. But it also includes some invertebrates. Um, and the sea squirt is very closely related to chordata. So it, uh, what I've learned and what I want to pursue in future work is that a lot of times these distinctions and categories are based on anatomies that can only be seen in the early developmental stages, the embryonic stages. Later, we change, we differentiate, and some of those characteristics are difficult, if not impossible, to see, but, but quite clear in the early stages. So the history makes a difference. These are all nudibranchs, different species, different shapes, colors. Couldn't resist doing that. Sometimes, I mean, usually I visually isolate one animal, but in this case, this urchin was cradling this beautiful little limonera crab, and I thought, oh, they're wonderful together. I'll just photograph them together. This is one of my favorites called a stubby squid. You never know what an animal's going to do when they're put in the tank. And so I watch for a while, and usually I watch before the animal goes into the tank. And in this case, I just couldn't believe it when the animal kind of 
propped itself up on its legs and, and, and assumed this gesture, but it did. Um, I can't get these animals to do anything. Uh, they just do what they do, and I try to wait until they're relatively at ease, though I don't know if that's quite uh, accurate, but r relatively relaxed in the tank. Um, I don't want a picture of a stressed out animal, so I try and keep the water at the right temperature, filter it for clarity, uh, and then I take my cues from the scientists who know these animals best. This is called a Tahitian glass sausage. Great name. It's a sea cucumber. And this also is a sea cucumber, the black spotted sea cucumber. This is just the end showing the uh, emergent feeding tentacles. And this was an incredible experience photographing this stiff footed sea cucumber because Dr. Gustav Pauli. Um, had collected the animal right off of San Juan Island, but all I could see, those beautiful tree-like uh, uh, extended tentacles were not extended. They were all retracted when the animal came in the lab. So it was kind of like this white shag rug thing. And he said, he said, it's, you don't see these very often, and even less often do you see the emergent tentacles. But he said, maybe if you wait long enough, you'll be able to see that and photograph it. And it took days uh, <laughs> for the animal to feel comfortable enough to fully extend this, these beautiful tree-like tentacles. So those are used for, for feeding and sensing the environment, but can in an instant be retracted for safety. This is another sea cucumber called a uh, petal sea cucumber. And again, this red sort of feathery form can be retracted in an instant. Those are feeding tentacles. And when they're retracted, it just looks kind of like a a pink lump, and it's very hard, kind of a, a cuticle kind of material that the animal's made of, so it's quite hard to the touch. These probably most of you have seen. Um, they're, you know, the classic gooseneck barnacles, but it was nice to be able to look at them in a slightly different way and to visually isolate them. Uh, in, the, in the photograph. This was one of the biggest surprises for me. I don't know how many of you have seen beautiful white egg cowries, beautiful shells. Um, they're not endangered, fortunately. And a lot of people uh, covet them. And you'll see, I have one on my dashboard uh, in my car. But a lot of people collect them. And they're beautiful, a beautiful white shell, high gloss, the highest gloss you can imagine, a pure white shell. And lo and behold, the animal that lives inside the shell is black like this. It looks like the night sky. And I had to wait a long time for the animal to emerge. Uh, but it was such a revelation, you know, that this black animal with these beautiful white dots would live inside this pristine, beautiful white shell. Uh, this is uh, another uh, type of sea urchin. And here we have the airstrip nudibranch, tiny little pink nudibranchs. And this is an interesting thing. This is a crab. I showed you earlier some collector crabs that collected algae for camouflage. This is a crab that actually hooks on another organism, in this case a sea pen, onto its back so that from above it probably looks like a sea pen or it could confuse a predator. Who knows? And perhaps the sea pen gets some mobility and table scraps out of the arrangement. In this case, the same kind of crab collects a fire sponge and keeps it propped up like that. And fire sponges, um, I've had the unfortunate experience of touching a fire sponge. And they have little sp speculoes that are extremely painful. Um, and so this is a good defense for this crab to keep that fire sponge up there like that. This is called a Columbia dodo. It's a tiny, tiny little animal that almost looks like a glass figurine. Um, lovely, delicate. And this is a Puget Sound king crab. Really gorgeous animal. Um, everybody at the Friday Harbor Marine Lab loves these animals. And so this particular one was being kept as a pet by one of the scientists there uh, in a tank for observation. I was able to photograph it. And this is a close-up of the face of a Puget Sound king crab. I mean, just spectacular colors. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, do you enhance the colors in your photographs? And I say, no. I mean, the real challenge here is getting the colors to be rendered anywhere near as spectacular and as saturated as they are. 
um, it's, yeah, it's a whole other world. This is Friday Harbor at Friday Harbor Marine Lab. This is their dock uh, on San Juan Island, Washington State, where I did quite a bit of the field work for this project. And this in, is Dr. Gustav Pauli, who I worked with extensively over the last seven years. And he's searching for marine invertebrates here on one of the rubber tire bumpers off the dock, which proved to be a very, very fertile search. So they exist sometimes in what one might think of as unlikely places. But this tire bumper was a treasure trove of marine marine invertebrates. It's a healthy marine environment, uh, which of course helps. And this is on the research vessel called the Centennial. And there's a variety of collection techniques that were employed, one of them dredging. And because it's not a coral reef habitat, we could actually drag this for short distances on the bottom, collect various things. You never know. It's like a surprise package each time. And then haul it up and let it loose in these big trays on the vessel. And of course, there's all kinds of algae and wonderful marine invertebrates here that have been collected. The students were um, very excited about collecting things. And we were trying to separate things so that we didn't have animals that would eat each other in the same bucket. Um, and these animals were awaiting their portrait. You can see in the sort of lower left here, there's kind of this pink round shaped thing. And that's the um, petal sea cucumber that I showed you a little bit earlier that had this beautiful red feathered protrusion. But that's the way it looks like if you were diving or something or snorkeling, you'd probably see it looking like this. Uh, with surprise yet to come. And these were selected out for special treatment, some very beautiful mollusks there. And this is the actual lab environment where the scientists and students work. And these are called sea tables. And fresh seawater is pumped in from the uh, harbor just outside. And that marine lab has been there for over 100 years. So they, it's a, a wonderful place, kind of like a West Coast Woods Hole. Um, where marine research is done. And animals can be kept happy here for observation and study. So it was a great environment for me to work in. Here I am again in the corner of that lab with a little area set up for photography. And that's my little aquarium. And I'm hand holding again the light and photographing a hermit crab here. It's just emerging. Um, so you can see. I have a special fondness for hermit crabs. And so um, I photographed a lot of them. Uh, this is a very interesting nudibranch called a tritonia. A lot of uh, neurological research is being done in these animals because their brain cells are big enough and there are few enough of them so that it, the relationship between behavior and these brain cells can be teased out more easily than with a more complex animal. So these have been research animals for a number of years there. They're shapeshifters. This is what they look like or can look like looking down because they can flatten themselves out. That's another thing is because these animals are spineless and they have hydrostatic skeletons, in other words, they depend on the water for their support, their shapes are um, wonderfully diverse. And uh, they truly are shapeshifters. These are picagonids, which are like water spiders, sea spiders. In most of these pictures, there's a, two of them that are kind of you know, in tandem. Some of them, these pictures, they're on top of each other. I, this is two of them, almost looking like a, a snowflake superimposed. These are worm tubes. These worms build tubes out of sand. And not any sand grain will do. They're very picky about sand grains. Quite a bit of research has been done on these. And this is the animal that lives inside. It's called a pheronid. It's its own phyla. Um, lovely animal, but it can retract inside this tube. And this is the tube built by another tube building worm called an ice cream cone worm. And again, they are very selective about sand grains. They're like little artisans. You know, this, they're like little masons. And they have a kind of secretion that will hold the sand grains together like a mortar. Um, that, that they can build these protective tubes from. This again is Dr. Gustav Pauli, and he is reaching down, down, down uh, to try and capture a diapatra, a beautiful uh, tube worm that lives deep in the sand. And this is low tide up on San Juan Island, False Bay. And at this point, he was saying, I need an arm extension. You know, I can't, it's like he could feel it, but he needed to go deeper. The students were trying to help by digging the hole a little bit bigger. And fortunately, he was able to extract this worm complete and whole with its tube. And he's here showing it to students. And it was pouring down rain, which it oftentimes is there. But this is the worm that lives inside this 
tube, the diapatra, just absolutely fantastic with iridescence and marvelous projectiles and oh, it's just beyond description. And this is a feather duster worm, also a tube building worm, and it's got some green algae that's sort of festooning its tube. But it can uh, retract those tentacles just faster than the eye can track. But of course, here, the, it almost looks like a flower. They're emerged for, uh, for feeding. This is another one of those crazy decorator crabs. This one was such a mess. It collected, it was, you know, it only liked this color, the sort of like very neutral kind of beigey brown color. And it had algae, it had hydroids, it had all kinds of stuff on it, as you can see. And I kept trying to kind of clean up the tank and then I just gave up. I thought, well, part of the character of this animal is just to be a mess, so I'll just let it be a mess. And here is a close up. If you look right in the middle of this picture, you can probably see the eye, kind of. <laughs> so, yeah, it's wild, but probably functions very effectively for this animal in terms of camouflage and avoiding predators. This is a simple, I mean, I say simple because common, you know, um, muscle that I saw in a tide pool, but I was really attracted to the, to the patterning on, on the shell, and I collected it and looked up close and realized that all those little things are in fact animals. They're little two building worms, and the largest animal here you see is a scallop. There's bryozoans, all kinds of wonderful things happening. So it's like a little living community. And my editor uh, in New York at Abrams, Andrea Dunez, said, oh, I want an evening gown that looks like that. So uh, who knows, maybe someone will be inspired to do that. This is a, a ornate Latiris, a beautiful shell, but even more beautiful animal, this gorgeous red carnelian animal emerging from the shell, and another mollusk with the animal just emerging. And this is a pom-pom crab, really neat adaptation. The little pom-poms that you see that the crab is holding onto are in fact stinging anemones. And these kind of crabs, this is their lifestyle. They find these, these anemones and they keep them tight. And the anemones are beneficiaries of this arrangement because they get mobility and table scraps. The crab gets the benefit of having little boxing gloves that will sting a potential predator. Probably many of you have seen these cone snails. Again, people love to collect the shells. This is called a textile cone. But you see the animal here coming out. These are very dangerous, actually. You see a little kind of spear, um, spear-shaped right up there. And that is uh, filled with a toxic venom, uh, has been known to kill people. So when you handle this animal, you must handle it from the other end or not handle it at all. Uh, but they're quite amazing, the cone snails, whole group of animals. This is another one of the animals that I photographed that has since been described as a new species. This is called the Wanawana crab. Uh, you can kind of pick out the eyes. It looks a little bit like Jabba the Hutt, I think. Uh, but it was collected from about 800 feet down on the Noah vessel around French Frigate Shoals. So the two animals that I've shown you that are new species to science all live below 800 feet. So that's, you know, they're amazing realms of life uh, the deeper you go, too, that are less known. These are called Venus's girdle. Dr. Gustav Pauli, when I was on my first uh, field trip for this project, which was a, a little about seven years ago now, he came up to me. He just met me. He saw my photographic setup. He came up to me on the ship with a mason jar with a lid on that was filled with water. And he said, if you can photograph this, you can photograph anything. And I said, I don't see anything in there. And he just smiled and walked away. And I thought, hmm. So I went out in the deck. There was some sun. And I held it up to the sun. And finally, I saw these little shimmery things in there. And th this is what they were. They're, uh, probably the transparency of these animals uh, serve them well because they can avoid predators because it's very difficult to even see them. But it was also very difficult to photograph them. But I did it. Um, very interesting, these next two pictures are of mantis shrimp. Um, they distinguish themselves in a couple of ways. But the main way is that color receptors, we humans have three sets of rods and cones, color receptors. Mantis shrimp have 16. 
they have the, the most sophisticated visual acuity of any animal known. Uh, they can see things that we can't even imagine. Plus, they can see 3D, and they can see 360 degrees without turning their head. This one has the extra added advantage of a tail end that looks a lot like an urchin. So no one's going to mess with this animal. This is another uh, species of green sea urchin. And these are called ribbon worms. They're really long. They can stretch long, 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 long. You know, unimaginably long. And this is a, a sea uh, cucumber called a leopard sea cucumber from the mid-Pacific. And I love the patterning on, on the side. So I just kind of did this close up. It's very, very inspirational, I think, the colors, designs, and textures, just from an aesthetic point of view. They're wonderful. Um, this is a pretty cool little creature with uh, big sort of paddle thumbs um, from around San Juan Island. And this is a frilled dog welt. And again, one of these very diaphanous um, frosted nudibranchs. Uh, I think, you know, Frank Geary sort of may have been inspired by this animal. I don't know. It's really hard to see on the screen, but um, it does render beautifully in the book. It's just very architectural and beautiful. This is a necklace worm and a fuzzy crab and another kind of anemone. And this is a diamondback nudibranch. And this is a scallop. I asked uh, another scientist that I've learned a lot from, Dr. Cohn from University of Washington. I said, well, why do um, scallops have so many eyes? And he said, because they don't have necks, of course. Um, I said, oh, OK. <clears throat> this is um, a conch. And again, this is a shell that a lot of people have seen. But seeing the animal is a much more rare thing. You can see the eye kind of protruding up here. And this is the foot that's coming out of the shell. It can move very quickly. Um, and this is a beautiful shrimp, marbled shrimp from around French frigate shoals. And this is my favorite of all the decorator crabs, I guess probably because it's just the most colorful. This crab collected a lot of red and green algae and some uh, hydroids coming out of its uh, snout there. And this is a giant spider conch. You can just see the eye just checking things out to see if it's safe to uh, come out and make a run for it, which is what he's doing here. This is another one of these really, really beautiful nudibranchs. And this is a very old evolutionarily leaf foot shrimp, kind of a living fossil and a pregnant one at that. And this is an 18 scaled worm. And this is just beautiful I, to see how this animal is actually structured. These are like little plates um, that it adorns itself with. And this is a sea cucumber nudibranch that kind of mimics a sea cucumber in patterning, but it's in fact a nudibranch, and this is just different uh, shapes that that animal can assume. This is a clown nudibranch. And this is the first time I ever tried to do a portrait of an animal still in the egg. So these are young squid in the egg case. And then a little bit of a close up. You can get a sense of the animal developing. And here is just after hatching. This is a leaf flatworm. This drama unfolded right under my lens. I was so surprised. The flatworm is the animal that you see at the top that resembles a leaf. And then there's a nudibranch, a dark little animal to the lower left. And then you see in the lower right this flatworm engulfed the nudibranch and consumed it. I, was, I ran to the scientist. I said, I, I don't know what's happening. It seems like this flatworm is eating the nudibranch. And they said, oh, well, that's exactly what you're seeing because flatworms are carnivores. So I'm really glad that these flatworms are not the size of double beds because we'd be in trouble, I think. <laughs> they, I just Sometimes I have nightmares. It could just wrap around me and consume me with enzymes. This is um, another. Wonderful decorator crab, different style, different taste, and what it likes to attach to itself. Yet another one. This one liked red kind of knee pads. 
And this was on the vessel uh, at Friday Harbor Lab. This was a plankton tow. So the, this um, apparatus that you see is just towed alongside the vessel, which moves, and it collects the animals that actually live in the water column. And Sylvia Earle, who wrote a wonderful foreword for the book, Spineless, and with whom I've been in the field many times, and I've known her for many decades, um, told me when we were walking on the beach at Midway a few years ago, she knew I was working on this book, and she said, well, what, what are you thinking in terms of a title? And I said, Spineless. And then the subtitle could be Portraits of Marine Invertebrates, the Backbone of Life in the Sea. And she said, no, it's not just Backbone of Life in the Sea. She said, it's the Backbone of Life, because this realm of marine animals is the foundation for all of life on the planet. And she speaks beautifully about the blue heart of the planet being the ocean itself. And she talks about the water literally being alive. And it is. This is Dr. Alan Cohn looking at some of the water that was uh, collected in that plankton tow. And this you can't even see really, but you get some sort of impression of all of the tiny animals that live in the water column in healthy places. This is, the water is literally alive. And this is uh, a lovely mollusk that actually started laying eggs as I was photographing. You never know what's gonna happen in front of your lens and they carry on with their lives, which is of course what I want. It's a top snail. And these are some of the eggs that it laid. This is, um, at Friday Harbor Marine Lab, we were out on a field trip and I heard a lot of excitement. These are students and scientists both. And they were, people were gathering. I knew something great had been discovered. And uh, Gustav showed me, he said, this is, this is his hand holding this flatworm. He said, this is a giant flatworm. It's the largest flatworm in the world. It's rare. I've never seen one here. I've known about it. I've read about it. It's the first time I've ever seen one. Do you want to photograph it? And I looked at it and I thought, I don't think I'm going to be able to do much with that. It's just a brown blob. You know, some of the other flatworms have these beautiful patterns and just stunning. But this one, I just, I, you know, it's big, but in a photograph, you can't tell how big it is. So, but I said, okay, I'll try. And he said, well, if we take it back to the lab, you have to promise me that you'll bring it back to this exact spot tomorrow morning because there aren't that many of these. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. I'll take special care. And once in the lab, this animal assumed the most amazing gestures. It was like a contortionist. It had an amazing repertoire of things that it could do with its body. All the students gathered around the scientists gathered around, and we were pretty sure that we were witnessing something that humans had never seen before. Um, because who would ever, like, be able to see this? <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to, like, put it in a tank and be convinced to do so, which I was, um, and then just let it do its thing. And so I learned a lot from this because it was far from a brown blob in front of the cameras, one of my, one of my favorite images, actually, now. This is a day octopus. Octopus are my favorite of all the marine invertebrates. They're the smartest by far. You know when you look at an octopus that someone's home there. Uh, they look back at you. Uh, they're great escape artists. They can change their color, patterns, textures faster than the eye can track. They're very successful evolutionarily, cephalopods. And these are some pictures of different octopus in earlier stages. Uh, the last one, this one also is a juvenile. It's the cover octopus, but a different um, image of that particular animal. And here's a close-up of the eye. These are chromatophores, these little sacs of pigment that respond to impulses from the brain. Um, octopus kind of wear their heart in their sleeve, and they show and can react vis-a-vis um, -vis their cro chromatophoric expressions um, quite beautiful to see. This is um, an octopus with its eye closed. And these are, this was out also on a, on a field trip. These are also a member of the cephalopod family. And they don't have much of a repertoire of behavior. They're called chitons, and they're quite primitive. Um, but quite beautiful. They're like jewels that tend to attach themselves to rocks. This is a kind of a sample of the different shapes and forms that chitons come in. The one in the lower right is curled up. That, they can do that. They can actually roll themselves up uh, into a little ball if need be. 
And this is another photograph of that beautiful stock jelly that I showed you earlier. I photographed this as the same kind of animal, only on a black background. I was quite fascinated with um, photographing them. And these are sea stars. All of us are familiar with sea stars. And there are many, many shapes and sizes of sea stars. They're top line predators in their marine environment. So most of the other animals are afraid of them. Uh, this is a little series of hermit crabs. I'm going to uh, wind up my presentation with hermit crabs. And this is a hermit crab that's actually living inside a sponge. That big orange form is a sponge, uh, a live sponge that presumably gets the benefit of mobility and out of that arrangement. Uh, it seems to work for both parties. Um, more hermit crabs. And these, each of these images is the same species of hermit crab, but different uh, choice of shell on the part of each individual crab. So different homes, same species of hermit crab, pretty much based on shells that are available to be had in their environment. Sometimes there is not a lot of choice. This one on the bottom, of course, had the luxury of being able to inhabit this beautiful cone snail shell. Um, but these are all the same species of crab, different, vastly, wildly different homes. Same here. The one on the bottom, you know, that's kind of a damaged shell, but crab is making it work until he finds a better one. This is what I call the nudist. So this is a hermit crab on the upper left without a shell or any protection whatsoever. So that's the abdomen, and it has little hooks on the end of the abdomen that it can grab onto the inside of a shell. And of course, then once I introduced this shell, it was coveting that shell and quickly jumped inside uh, for protection. Hermit crabs really don't like to be without that protection because they're so vulnerable. That's all, that abdomen area is really, really soft and uh, tasty, I'm imagining. So this is the last image of my presentation today. This is a hermit crab that is in a shell that has two anemones. There's an anemone on each end of the shell that's not open here, but it can open. Um, and then there's another anemone on the front, and then there's a two building worm, and then there's what turned out to be a very rare barnacle on the top. The scientists were way more excited about the barnacle than they were about the crab. So it's kind of fun to uh, piggyback with these scientists because they're like kids, you know, very enthusiastic, and of course artists are the same way. So there were a lot of discoveries to be made in this realm of life. And before I close and open it up to questions, which is my favorite part, um, I just would like to say that uh, in the process of doing this field work, I was working with a lot of different scientists, and some of them were climate scientists. I shared some uh, space in the wet lab with uh, a NOAA scientist who was collecting water samples and monitoring for ocean acidification levels. And he was pretty alarmed at what he was seeing. Um, and that was several years ago. And I've kept up somewhat with this research. I think that if these animals could speak, all these animals that I've showed you here today, uh, they would cry out for help. Um, their habitats are becoming increasing, which is the marine environment. That water is becoming increasingly more acid. The pH is changing. This is well known. It's a simple chemistry experiment. Um, so much of the fossil fuel emissions have been, uh, the carbon sink is what it's oftentimes referred to, um, have been absorbed by the oceans. And with that, the oceans become more acidified. Most of these animals depend on calcium carbonate for their life. They need the calcium to build their shells. And they extract it from the water. And if there's less of it in the water, they have a harder time laying down their shells. And also, once their shells are laid down, there's the risk of the acidified waters dissolving their shells. So particularly corals and mollusks are at risk. But all these marine invertebrates, virtually all of them depend uh, on calcium carbonate to live. And without a healthy marine environment with these animals thriving, um, we don't thrive well either. So uh, they're, uh, they can't cry out for help, literally, but I'm kind of like being their, their vehicle here. Uh, so with that, are there any questions or comments that anybody would like to offer? <laughs> now, my one question I had during all your pictures was I had no idea of the scale of anything. Ah, that's that, intentional. That's, that's kind of, OK. <laughs> um, so his comment question, which is a good one, and I saw your hand up earlier, but I thought I'd just have to wait till, till, till later for questions, um, was a good one, which is, I have no idea when I'm looking at these images how big anything is. What's the scale? 
Uh, in the book, it's the same. And that is one of the magic uh, things about photography is that you don't get to know how big something is unless the photographer wants you to by including something that you know is a scale reference. In the book, in the back, there are wonderful profiles written by Dr. Bernadette Holtus about each animal. And included with that is scale information. And I collected that in my field notes. But it isn't the first thing I want people to know. Because many of these animals are tiny. They're not all tiny, but many of them are. And I kind of want to present them as heroic and monumental. And uh, so I want people, I don't want people to know first off how big it is. But I want people to be able to find out how big it is. But a presentation like this, I just sort of elect not to. Sometimes I would say the dodo is only 0.2 millimeters long, tiny, like little glass figurine. Um, and then sometimes I would say this is a juvenile of a Pacific giant octopus, which gets very, very big, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. I mean, yeah, for most of these, I know how big they are. But like octopus can be anywhere from tiny to huge. Boy, uh, can it ever. You know, nudibranch can be from. Yes, nudibranchs really vary. They're bigger in the Pacific Northwest than they are in the Central Pacific. Um, so that I don't want to hide that information ultimately, but it's not the first thing I want to see. I don't want to put a scale reference in there for you. I want this to be a kind of other kind of experience. Yeah. It was just, thank you very much. I was just wondering if you could talk a little about your, your photographic setup, what type of camera and lenses, and any unique challenges that you've had to overcome. Yes. Um, he's asking about my photographic setup. I, I showed you the, the tanks and that kind of thing, sort of how I deal with photographing marine animals in um, filtered water, clear water, which I, I filter it myself and keep the temperature right and all of that. The camera that I use for this project, and you know, for 30 years I've been making these portraits and I always used cameras and film, usually a Hasselblad or even sometimes an 8x10 camera. Um, when I started this project in 2006, I switched to digital. So I'm using a Canon uh, DS Mark III for this. All of these pictures were, were <clears throat> taken with that camera and bronze color lighting, which I got about halfway through this project, and I love it. So, so I'm hand holding, you know, a bronze color strobe. And what you can't see in most of the pictures that I showed you of kind of my setup is that I have a light source that's like a light box <clears throat> that has like a translucent white front, and it's known for being even, edge to edge, top to bottom. So I'm placing that behind the aquarium, and maybe six to eight inches behind, because I don't want the light to flare around the subject of the photograph. But that's creating that white background. And then I make sure that that, I do a lot of testing in advance. I make sure that that's very close to 255 on the histogram, so that it will come out white. I don't want it over, because then it will, it's unnecessary, and it'll flare, and it'll cut the contrast. Um, but I also, you probably saw shadows. In a lot of cases, these animals are sitting on something. They're sitting on a piece of white um, formica, basically, that I kind of sand for, for I, I don't want it to be super shiny. Um, because you, th those are real shadows, the guy's sitting on something. So I, I, I want that to be seen. Um, the only thing that I do with Photoshop, I, I never, you know, knock out a background with Photoshop because it looks cut out. It just never, I can always tell if that's what's been done. Um, is that I will clean up backgrounds. The crabs are notoriously messy. So you can start out with perfectly clean water and then the crab goes in and it's like, oh my God. So there's just schmutz everywhere. So I'll, I'll retouch that out. Sometimes I'll give them a little, you know, styling if there's too much schmutz. But, you know, most of these decorator crabs, I don't want to remove anything because that's part of their whole character. So I don't do a lot. I don't do much with Photoshop that I couldn't have done in a, in a dark room or in a kind of, you know, more um, what analog way. <clears throat> I don't know if that's a correct term, but yeah. Lenses. The lenses that I use most often here, um, there's a five, 1x to 5x Canon close-up lens that's marvelous. And I used that a lot. And then I used a macro lens a lot, 100 macro. Those were the ones I used the most. Sometimes I stretched out in other places, but yeah. I had a, one final question, I guess. What is the yeah. um, impact of water pressure on, on the um, you know, specimens you're collecting? It seems most of them are fairly close to the surface. Have you, have you done deeper? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good comment question, which is, what about the water pressure on some of these animals that are coming from deeper places? Most of the animals I showed you are kind of you know near shore or coral reef 
creatures, but not all of them, because at the French Frigate Shoals expedition that we went on, we were collecting animals from you know, beyond 800 feet deep. The two animals that are new species to science were both collected in baited lobster traps that were set to uh, over 800 feet. So I, you know, I've worked with fish, not in this project, and with um, collectors and scientists who have popped the swim bladders when they bring up fish from quite deep because the pressure is really an issue for keeping those animals alive. I, these are spineless creatures. They're, I, they're, uh, I, and I'm not an expert in this, but I think they're not as vulnerable to pressure changes. Uh, because both of those animals were kept alive on the ship that came up a along with many others that deep. Um, I'm, I can't imagine that there aren't certain considerations, but I don't know the details. Yeah. And you, you mentioned one project of what's next. Anything else on your, on your uh, mind well, artistically? You know, I got very interested when I was doing, uh, I could photograph marine vertebrates for the rest of my life. I mean, and, and six lifetimes. I mean, there's just so much out there. Um, and yet to be discovered. So, but what I became really interested in were the developmental stages of a lot of these animals, which you see in, um, you know, they're embryological stages. So, for example, that broad-based tunicate that I said was kind of like relatively closely related to chordates or us, and you would never know. It looks like an orange vegetable. But in its embryological stages and in our embryological stages, we each have evidence of something called a notochord and pharyngeal gill slits. Those are two early evolutionary features that defined chordates. So, but you can't see it unless you go into that developmental stage and look at it, which is through a microscope. So I'm really interested in kind of diving into inner space a little bit in a, in a next project. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Susan, thank you very much for thank speaking you. with us. The book is available um, wherever books are sold. So thanks for speaking at Google. <laughs>